my name is Chris Moyer. Wim is there and he can speak for himself. Heidi Porter was also supposed to be on this session tonight, but she is under the weather. So it's just going to be uh, Wim and I. And we're going to be talking about ransomware, not just about ransomware per se, although we'll get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts of it, but uh, ransomware as it pertains, specifically as it pertains to FileMaker servers. So, I mean, it's one thing if ransomware, you know, brings part of your network down or brings some of your servers down, but what we as FileMaker people who are often responsible for a FileMaker server should care the most about is what sort of impact that might have on a FileMaker server. And so that's kind of the primary thing we're gonna be here to talk about. Um, it, just a quick intro for me. My name is Chris Moyer. I started off as a sales engineer at Claris back in the early 90s. Uh, hung out my own shingle in 95, I want to say, and have been doing databases ever since. And so um, have been interested in this topic for several years. Back in 2016, we had a customer get hit with a ransomware attack and we were able to get them back up. They opted not to pay the ransom. But uh, ever since then, this has been something that we've been sort of keeping an eye out on just to make sure that, you know, if, if you want to think of such a thing as a full stack FileMaker developer where you need to not only know how to do your FileMaker development, but you need to know how to deploy FileMaker server on the different platforms and, you know, understand IIS and that sort of thing. To our mind, we thought ransomware is sort of part of the picture these days and so this is something else that we should at least have a passing familiarity with and so uh, we owe it to ourselves and probably to our customers to you know at least have a clue of where to begin on this topic so Wim. Thank you Chris. Um, like Chris my history with uh, with all things FileMic it goes back to the early 90s um, and I've always been very active uh, in all things around deployments right not just the development side of things but very much the deployment side um, and a lot of that will surface, just like uh, as Chris said, in, in this topic. Um, and, and while we don't expect everybody here as, as good FileMaker developers to, to become experts deployers, I think there's a minimum um, level of knowledge that we need to gather or at least be aware of. Even if you don't know how to do certain things that we'll talk about today, at least be aware that, they, that they're there so that you can you can find out and seek out the expertise of those those who can. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about deployments today and, and not a whole lot about developing uh, FileMaker solutions, um, but it'll be interesting. All right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen and get my this right over my play button. Let me see if I can hit it. Here we go. All right, hopefully everybody can see this. So this is our FileMaker server ransomware slide deck, and women are going to sort of tag team this. Um, one important thing to note that I always like to sort of start off with uh, about ransomware is that ransomware is all about uh, a crime of extortion. So they are trying to apply pressure to an individual organization to get them to pay them money. And so one way they apply pressure is they cripple your network, uh, bring your servers down, lock up your data and in your zeal to get the, uh, access back to your network and your servers and your data, you will pay them money. Um, and as people have gotten better at uh, building out their resiliency, you know, they can recover and say, these people can go pound sand, I'm not going to pay these crooks, you know, I'll just go to a backup. They have added arrows to their quiver, as it were. And so now they're going even farther and saying, you know what, we're going to exfiltrate your data and maybe you are a medical office and you have HIPAA compliance regulations and so under threat of them exposing your patient data and causing a problem for you you know now maybe you'll say yes i have a backup but they have my data and can publicly embarrass me so i'll pay my ransom and so they use a couple of different techniques at least the more sophisticated attacks to to apply pressure to you they might, you know, if they pull a customer list from you, they might also go to your clients and say, hey, we got your data out of this vendor of yours and uh, we want you to lean on them too. So they pay the ransom and everybody's happy here. So, um, you know, with that thought in mind, there, there's uh, two things, I guess I'd just sort of like to start with. One is super simple that everybody should be doing right away. And that is turning on encryption at rest. Uh, if it 
uh, ever happens that someone exfiltrates the FileMaker database or grabs the backups or something like that, you want to do everything you can to make sure that data is useless to them and that they can't get data out of it. And the easy way to do that is turn on encryption at rest. So I just like to start with always turn on encryption at rest. All right, so our agenda, um, I spoke about uh, the fact that, you know, back in 2016, we had a client get attacked uh, about this. And in the wake of that, Heidi Porter and I, you know, decided that we needed to learn a lot more about this topic. So we started going to the DEF CON, not to be confused with DEF CON, D-E-F-C-O-N, security conference. It's a uh, hacker conference in Las Vegas. And we've been there, I want to say, three out of the last five years since then. Uh, it's eye-opening. Um, it, it's super hard to describe. It's a massive conference. I think it's the largest hacker conference in the world. It takes place typically over four hotels. Uh, they will hack everything from marine systems to hack ships, uh, cars. They hack the CAN bus and cars, industrial control systems, medical devices, um, you name it, they'll hack it. There's a lock picking village. Um, there is how to break into secure courier material. So if you have like uh, confidential shipping envelopes and stuff like that, how to use dry ice and things like that to get these things open in an undetected fashion. Um, they have contests, they do social engineering. It's mind boggling, the kind of stuff that goes on in this conference. So. For those of you who have the ability to hit that conference, it usually takes place in the summertime. Um, and I think it will be in person next year. Uh, I strongly recommend it. It is an eye opener um, and, and we've learned a ton. And in the past, um, ransomware has been mentioned, but it hasn't usually been center stage. But this past year we went um, and they had tons of COVID restrictions. You had to have proof of vaccination to get in the door and wear a mask and all that kind of thing. But, you know, in previous years, it was the type of deal where ransomware was mentioned here and there. But um, this time, every single session made mention, like, you have to do this because of ransomware. Um, and for the first time ever, they actually uh, were discussing ransomware simulation toolkits so that, you know, it's one thing to know about ransomware in the abstract and say, yeah, this is a problem. We should probably be ready for it. It's another thing to actually be able to simulate an attack on your network or on a server and actually, you know, war game the process because while a lot of people are familiar with ransomware in the abstract, they haven't really like gotten their hands on it and touched it and saw what it did and tried to figure out ways of detecting it or short circuiting it or anything like that. And so, you know, just this year, it became possible for you to actually simulate attack an attack on a server. And in our case, we're interested in doing this to a FileMaker server and sort of see, you know, does your plan work? If this happens, will you be able to successfully uh, react to it and respond to it? And so um, we were super interested in that. Um, we started talking with Wim about this. And you know, as Heidi likes to say, Wim is always up for taking down a server. So, um, you know, given Wim's history with Punisher and uh, sort of putting the screws to a server, uh, it seemed like a, a sort of natural alliance here to kind of try and troubleshoot this. So Wim's been working with uh, a ransomware framework that he can talk more on uh, as we get to that part of the presentation. And then um, Heidi and I were sort of brainstorming some other things, like what could we do, like if a ransomware attack happened, you know, our chief concern is protecting the databases folder and the backups folder, and what could we do to um, protect that? And so we were interested in, uh, you know, hardening the FileMaker server, if you will, in researching that. And so we'll have more on that topic later. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, our, our goal with this presentation is to prepare all of you to be ready for the point in time when, you know, statistically speaking, ransomware is definitely on the increase. So the likelihood is high that at some point in the next few years, you will either your client uh, or someone that you're familiar with will, you know, have this problem. And so it'd be great for you to have some expertise to be ready for that. Um, as far as, you know, is this something I should be worried about? This is already happening. So 
you know, back in 2016, uh, 4,000 ransomware attacks were happening per day. And there's a lot of people out there, and I've heard this a lot, where people say, I'm just a little fish. I'm not the kind of target for these guys. And, and you know, thinking like that makes it sound like these people are flipping through the phone book and saying, hmm, are these guys big enough to be worth it? These are automated attacks. There are just swarms of bots just going out there and hitting everything it can to see what they get. So there's no you know, real discernment or target selection going on. They're just trying to hit what they can find. And, um, you know, then they'll make the call. And uh, we'll get into this also later in the presentation, but the bigger the target, um, it, it doesn't necessarily make it a more attractive target. Like if they can break into the Pentagon, you don't think the wrath of the cyber command is going to come down on someone who tries to tinker with uh, you know, military targets or national defense targets. So, uh, you know, the biggest fish is not necessarily a great target for them because it uh, increases the likelihood that there will be backlash. So actually, ironically, the people who think they're too small to be a target are the perfect target because they are less likely to have the resources to successfully defend against an attack like this. They're less likely to have the clout to, um, you know, bring a, a response from you know the United States government, unlike say Colonial Pipeline when they got hit, there was a response and uh, bad things happened to the the attackers. But anyway, I'm sort of rambling on here. So uh, a lot of these bullet points are particularly enlightening. So the average ransom in 2021 was 170k. Uh, this third bullet is a real eye opener. So for those people who think, hey, I'll just pay the ransom and get back back to business. Um, if you pay the ransom, 80% of those people who paid got hit again. So it's not in your best interest to just pay the ransom and try and get on with it because you're, it's just going to happen again. So the, the real goal here is to get better at uh, being a resilient organization. Um, less than half of the people who got attacked by ransomware got access to their data. Um, and then the data that they did get access to was kind of messed up. Average downtime is 15 business days. That's three weeks. Uh, that could put a huge dent in a lot of organizations. Uh, most people can't afford to be down that long. And so sometimes the sort of, you know, the, the epilogue to an attack like this could be that the company just completely goes down because it couldn't survive the sustained outage. And then there's the cost of uh, reputational damage. It doesn't look good if you get attacked by ransom. I mean, everybody's getting attacked by ransomware hackers now, but some people have a lot of shame around this. And so it is professionally embarrassing to them to say, yes, we got hit by a ransomware attack. Um, and so our thesis is that it's not a matter uh, of if you or your clients will get attacked, but when, you know, sooner or later, you're probably gonna get hit. Triple um, Eight, the FileMaker hosting company was attacked in late June. Um, Interesting fact about that was the attack happened at 2 a.m. And, you know, at first I was thinking, oh, how lucky is that? You know, most people are out of the databases. The, you know, people are in them doing transactions. So the database caches were likely to have been flushed to the drive. Um, but, you know, the more we've learned about ransomware attack uh, attacks, that this is pretty typical. You know, if you are trying a stealth attack on an organization, you do not want to do it in the middle of the day when their IT resources are available and people can go and plug servers and un unplug routers and uh, shut down servers. You want to do it at night. You want to do it on a holiday weekend. You want to do it when people are out of the office and the response is going to be slower. Or, you, you know, if you're super lucky, you might not get detected at all until it's too late. And so this is kind of a ty uh, typical thing to get attacked in the middle of the night. And Ironically, that's actually good for FileMaker databases because it means it's less likely that the database is to be in a volatile state. It should be kind of quiet in the middle of the night. You know, that's, you know, those time frames are when people, you know, like to run backups and things like that. And all, some people run overnight processes where, you know, that might get clipped by this sort of attack. But in, in general, I would say it's beneficial that these things, beneficial for the FileMaker database that these things happen in off hours. Um, and I guess I would like to pass this over to Wim at this point. All right. The, um, when we look at the ransomware attack, um, 
there's a lot going on there, right? And the actual act, the most visible part of a ransomware attack, the fact that you'll end up with your files being encrypted and the, and and basically losing the ability to, to work with them, that's really at the tail end of it, right? Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide there, there's a lot of things that are happening way before that. And when I say way, we're talking about potentially weeks and months uh, ahead of the actual fact of encrypting the files, right? Um, and I'll show, share my screen when, I, when we get to the actual live demo um, to show some of the, 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 the frameworks and the, and the information and the knowledge base, if you will, about some of, some of the, the different aspects and the tools that, that are being used in all of it. But very often an attack starts over on the, on the left-hand side with trying to get access to, to your network, right? It's all about how can they get in? And they're getting in these days uh, that's really all about phishing, right? That phishing and and weak pack passwords. That's really the the two ways that they that's that people can can gain access to uh, to the network to your infrastructure. Um, uh, and, and it could. It, but we're not necessarily talking about your FAMIC server at this point, right? This is really probably the the edges of your network uh, that that are being attacked and probed, if you will, at at this stage, right? So they'll take their time. They'll try to figure out who your users are, what kind of passwords you have. Uh, where people work, what they do, and do all of that, and then and then find a way into the uh, the edges of your infrastructure and your network. And of course, with COVID, um, the the old model of having a castle with a mode and a drawbridge and all of that stuff that's really that went away, right? We have all of these users working from home, with or without uh, company materials. Maybe they're working uh, they're working off their their home their their own private laptop or or their own desktop or their own tablet when they're sitting on the couch, that kind of thing, right? So so the old security model has been blown away, um, making it easier uh, for these phishing attacks to succeed. And and not just the phishing attacks, but getting access to parts of the network. It's way easier to compromise a home network than it is an enterprise network, right? So. Um, so that that is one of these things. So the compromise, that's really when they try to figure out whether you have unpatched vulnerabilities, right? That's when they will look for very actively look for things that they can that they can leverage that are known vulnerabilities to get into um, into the network deeper and deeper. So that middle part, that circle, that's really basically trying to move sideways, right? Say that they get access to a router, and you have an unpatched router or a network switch somewhere they can get in. Or your ring doorbell, or your your, uh, your 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 Nest camera, anything like that, right? So that's those are big attack vectors. They can go in, into your network and they try to move sideways. They try to burrow deeper and deeper into your network. And as they do that, they will take stock. They'll try to figure out what kind of file shares do you have anywhere, um, what kind of servers and what operating systems are we finding here. They basically take inventory of everything that they find and try to harvest as much as they can. Again passwords and names of servers, names of file shares, all of that good stuff, that's what they're after. And so they build a big long list of everything that they can look at. Um, and a lot of that information actually uh, isn't done while they're on your network, right? We're talking about small agents that collect a little bit of piece of information, send it off to the control center uh, so that the people, the evil people uh, can take their sweet time to go through all that data that they've exfiltrated from your network and and figure out what uh, what they can do, and, and that's that part right there on the right hand side of the of the circle. Right, there is a command and control center somewhere. Right, there's somewhere where all of that data gets collected, and and I'll show you that in the demo. What they'll put together is is a is a plan, right? A, a plan of attack where they'll say, we know what you have. We'll go there first, then we'll do that, then we'll do this, we'll do that, and at the end of the day, uh, we'll have a um, a solid plan of how to take you down. In essence, that's uh, that's what it's all about, right? So, in the case of um, of Famic Server, uh, and in general, anything that has backups, they will try to figure out uh, how you do your backups, where you keep your backups, and they will attack those backups first, typically days, weeks ahead of time. Um, <laughs> To some extent, on the premise that people don't look at their backups, um, and I guess we're all somewhat guilty of that. Um, but they will make sure that by the time you notice that you're being attacked, that you have no place to go. Right? Your your, your backups have either been blown away or they have already been compromised. Um, so that is all part of the plan. And when they're ready, they'll basically pull the trigger, as we will do in the demo as well, and they'll basically um, 
take down whatever is most important to you, right? And and the thing to remember here is that, um, as Chris said, it's a crime of extortion, right? Uh, they don't need to get all your stuff to win, right? They just need to be able to prevent you from using it. In however shape or form they do that, but if you cannot use your servers, you cannot use your Famica files, you cannot use a network, then they won, right? Basically, as long as they can lock you out or prevent you from doing your work, uh, they they will have uh, they will have won. And encrypting your files is a good way of doing that um, because then then you get nothing at the end of the day. So that's sort of like the uh, anatomy of a um, of a ransomware attack. And this is the one that I will show you in a little more detail when uh, when we get to sharing my screen for the demo. Uh, MITRE, uh, you can see the name there on the left-hand side, the top left-hand side, is a non-for-profit organization that does a lot of government-funded research. And one of the research areas that they have is building a catalog, if you will, or in this case, they call it a, um, a, a matrix. Uh, it, it's a catalog of all uh, well, not all of them, but they, they try to keep all of them, but it's basically a list of every single thing that attackers use along the lines, right? So if you read that, it's a little, sm a little smaller, I, I realize that, but over on the right-hand side is the, is, is the same as what we had on the infographic. Over on the right-hand side, that's the impact, that's the actual attack, that's the act of encrypting. So the tools that they'll use for encrypting are listed on the right-hand side. Over on the left-hand side are the tools that they will use to try and to figure out who you are, who your users are, all of that good stuff. Uh, and the screenshot doesn't do it justice, but the reason I, I'm, I have this arrow pointing at the middle section there, that's the column that is called defense evasion, right? Once they get onto your network and onto your infrastructure, they will do their, their best to try to convince you that they're not there, right? So, and I'll show you that when, when we show the screen. So the, the sheer number of things that they will try, so that column, that middle column is actually the longest in the defense evasion section, right? Well, that's, that, shows, that shows you how much effort that, that they put in in basically trying to convince you that, that, nothing is, that everything is fine, that nothing is going on, right? And, and we're talking here about things like disabling your, your anti-malware, your antivirus. So every single defense that they have, that's part of them trying to burrow and, and figure, figure out what, what, how you do things. They will take stock of your defenses and then use vulnerabilities for those to basically disable them or, or subvert them, right? So it, maybe they cannot stop them, but maybe they can stop the logs from getting to you so that you, um, or maybe they'll, they'll try to rewrite the logs on the way out so that when you do inspect the logs, there's nothing really that jumps out at you. So, um, so that's a really good, uh, uh, it makes for good reading material and you'll get the link in the, in the materials. Uh, I, a lot of it as Pharmac developers will go way over our heads when we read, as we read this, but it's a good, overview of the things that we should be talking about in all of these phases of a potential attack. It reminds me of that old saying, the greatest trick the, the devil ever pulled was convincing people that he didn't exist. It's like, I'm not yeah. here. Exactly. That's exactly what they do. All right. So um, one of the things that's been super alarming over the last couple of years is the professionalization of the ransomware gangs. Um, they, I mean, they're very brazen these days. And so if you were to fire up a, a Tor web browser and just go search for ransomware software, you can find it. I mean, you know, this is a uh, ransomware website for Lockbit 2.0. They have an affiliate program. They're out there bragging about how great their features are. Like, look at all the cool stuff we do. Um, you know, we're fast, it's designed in C. Um, encryption speed, self-spread function. Um, they say, here's some of the data we've exfiltrated, and you know, here's the, the timers running on these things, like if these people don't pay, then you know, they've got 14 hours or eight days and 14 hours left before you know, their dirty laundry is gonna be aired out. These people didn't pay, so their files got published. Bangkok Air, an airline, got their files published. Um, they're bragging about how their encryption speed relative to all their competitor products is way better, top of the charts here and stuff like that. And so for the fact for them to operate so publicly and so brazenly um, is concerning because it means people aren't getting to these people, people aren't catching them. Um, in the wake of the colonial pipeline attack, some servers did get uh, seized, some Bitcoin wallets got captured. 
Um, there's been some more stuff recently, just last month, where there does seem to be a little more of a, a public effort on, you know, not just the US, but other agencies around the world starting to get to some of these people. So some people have been captured in Eastern Europe and um, I believe are being extradited. So there has been slightly more pressure lately, but, um, you know, this affiliate program thing, you know, we mentioned at the beginning that phishing is sort of the, the the main entry point for malware to get on a network, but these people are recruiting disgruntled employees to say, hey, if you want to, you know, give the bird to your employer on the way out the door, you can drop a payload on the network for us and we'll give you a piece of the action. That's terrifying. I mean, how do you defend against that from an insider attack? Um, to me, that just... Uh, reinforces the the view that these ransomware attacks are going to become more common, not less, until something significant changes. And so it remains to be seen what that significant change will be. But uh, I just wanted to give you a sense for, you know, what this uh, world is like out there. And it's amazing to me how public they are with who they are and what they do and, you know, the features of their product, which I would think, you know, in a criminal enterprise, you would tend to want to keep some of that stuff on the down low, but no, they're they're recruiting and they're recruiting very publicly. Um, so circling back to the idea of, well, what happens if you have a FileMaker server that get, gets hit by ransomware? You know, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence and I meant to do this at the beginning of the session is just, you know, maybe do a survey and get a show of hands how many people on this uh, meeting either have direct experience with ransomware in terms of they or their clients have been hit by it uh, versus not. You know, we, we've done this a few times in the past and it's been about 50% in most cases. I'd be curious to see if that's the case here. Um, maybe it's a little higher because if people are coming to this talk, maybe they wanted to come to this talk because they had an experience with it. But um, so uh, we've talked to a bunch of people who have gotten hit with ransomware on a FileMaker server. And so, you know, this is not a hard, fast rule, and this is uh, to some extent one of the motivating factors for some of the experiments that wim has been doing, that Heidi's been doing. Um, you know, what happens? You know, how bad is the damage to a FileMaker database if the server gets locked up while the database is being hosted? And so if you have like a reference database, maybe you have a product catalog or something like that, and it doesn't get changed very often, and that thing gets encrypted, you know, it's not being modified, you know, typically or at all. It probably has a great chance of being fine. You know, maybe it's unhappy about being closed improperly, but if you were to recover it, it would probably be fine, probably be usable. Um, if you have more volatile files that are getting beat on a lot and might have uh, transactions sitting in the database cache and then the thing gets locked up, that's probably going to be a problem and probably not going to go well for you. Um, externally stored container data, you know, the container data is probably going to get encrypted. Um, will definitely get encrypted. And, um, you know, but if you decrypt it, that doesn't really impact the database itself. You know, the database will be fine. Um, and then there, there's this idea of a share lock. So, and I guess I'll leave that for Wim to address at, at more length. Um, you, you can talk about that, Wim, but um, that's a, a factor that's actually in FileMaker's favor, but I, I'll, we'll, we'll get to that some more. So, so we wanted to do, it's not a Skunk Works project or anything like that, but we just wanted to get more information for the FileMaker community said, you know, it'd be great if we had more concrete answers you know, with evidence and proof to back up, you know, some of this anecdotal stuff we've been seeing is like, let's really run a ransomware attack on a FileMaker server and let's have the databases in different states and, you know, see what the outcomes of that is. And then also, let's see if there's any way to harden a FileMaker server against attack and, you know, either block the databases and backups folders from getting encrypted or hiding them somehow. And then um, there are other ways to sort of get in the middle of a ransomware attack. And, you know, as we mentioned, you have these agents sitting there on your network burrowing and trying to move from machine to machine. But the entire time they're talking to a command and control server, 
And so this is really sort of outside the scope of what we've been working on, but if you can disrupt that communication between the agents and its C2 server, you know, that's a, a promising um, means of defense as well. And with that, Wim, why don't you uh, talk about what you've been uh, cooking up in the lab? Yep, all right. If you can make me present it as Steve. One of the things that, um, one of the takeaways from what uh, Chris was saying, um, and let me move some of the stuff out of, out of the way here, um, is the, the, the fact that ransomware is becoming so common uh, these days, right? So it's not a, a question of this, this thing that happens out there that will never touch you. Chances are at some point it will touch you or your clients. Um, and, and because of that, it really makes sense to try and try and find ways to to know what's going on, right? So we'll say that a few times in the rest of this presentation. Um, it really begins with knowing what is normal and what is not normal on your network, on your FileMaker server, uh, all of that stuff, right? Because if you have no clue what is going on in in a normal state, then you have no chance of detecting if if something is slightly off or if something is is happening even at at a very low level. Um, so, so that is key, right? And the tools that I, that I will, or the tool that I will use today can help in that because it's a, it's a, uh, it, it does the same things as an actual ransomware attack without, without leaving you, uh, with, uh, with thing with unusable stuff. Um, but because it simulates most of the crucial parts in the end phase of the attack. You can use that to, to basically run that and then see whether your defenses actually work, right? Are you detecting the fact that there is that there are these agents communicating with a control with a control center? Uh, are you detecting that there are files or processes running on the different devices that you have that you didn't expect, right? So you can use the framework to uh, to put a, an attack in motion and then see uh, if you can if you can make your your tripwires trip, right? Uh, so this what we're what we're looking at here. That's the MITRE attack, uh, the the um, attack matrix, um, in the defense evasion column that I was mentioning here. Um, that's how important that is in the whole uh, chain of attacks, right? And the impact right here, the data encrypted for impact. That's the the tail end, right? Just as I was saying, that that happens at the very very end, and you have all these things that are happening. Um, before they get to, to this point, including uh, things like phishing, right? Like gathering vi victim network information, uh, phishing for information. So all of that stuff happens at the beginning where they, they very gently try to probe around the edges and, and see, see what's there. Um, so that is all good stuff. So what we have in uh, the demo is I have a FAMAC server, um, nothing too fancy. This is the latest FAMAC server running on AWS EC2 instance. And because we're going to simulate the tail end of the of the attack, we're, we're basically going to assume at this point that your your server has been affected. We already have an agent uh, on there. So uh, I have this uh, this agent, it's disguising itself as file connector. Um, actually, I'll, I'll run it. Uh, there you go. Uh, of course, typically, you wouldn't see this kind of feedback, right? So it'll be it's just a process that runs on, on the server somewhere. Um, uh, but I, I have it uh, set to verbose mode so that we can actually see what it's doing. And it's not really doing anything, but it's basically trying to ping the control center uh, and see, hey, uh, master, if you will, uh, are you there? Are you, uh, can I report back to you? Um, the, the things that we have in red there is, is that the master isn't listening at this point. So we'll, we'll fix that in a moment, All right? So that's the FileMaker server. That's the FileMaker server in, in your network, your on-premise server anything like that, but that's what you have. Now, I'm the evil guy, so I'm sitting somewhere, uh, and I have this uh, this little uh, Ubuntu Linux box here, uh, nothing too fancy, but um, I will fire off my, actually I'll do this. All right, and uh, what I need is just start the master software, if you will. And this is the part of the, sorry, uh, taking one step back. The framework uh, that I'm using is on GitHub, 
right? So, um, uh, so you can download it for free. It has two components, obviously. It has a server component. That's the one that we're looking at here um, that basically mimics the command and control center. Then there's the agent components, uh, the one that I installed on my Famica server, that's the other part, right? And both of them are open source. The Famica, sorry, the server part is written in Go. The uh, agent is written in C Sharp. Um, so you can just tweak them to your heart's content. Uh, we'll just fire the server. And with the server running, if we were to go back and look at, at, the, um, at the agent here, uh, you'll see that the agent uh, now gets a response from the uh, master from the control center. Right, so the agent is now talking to the control center. Uh, the moment leading up to the actual attack it is probably when the agent and the server or the attackers, if you will, are at the most vulnerable, right? Because they have to communicate and they have to do things. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in the, a little later, but encrypting files is a somewhat heavy activity, right? It's processor he uh, heavy, it's disk uh, heavy. So again, that's what, where, where the know your normal comes into play, right? So you need to be able to detect that, the fact that there is network communication happening that is over and beyond what, what is your normal. You need to be able to detect that there is processor activity that is not normal, and you need to be able to detect that there's disk activity that is not normal. All right, so. Uh, what I want to do from my control center, right? So I'm back to being the evil guy that um, at this point in the process as the evil guy, I think I have enough information about everything that you have, right? So I'm just going to set everything up so that I can pull the trigger. Um, so the first thing that I'll do is I want to see if I have any agents listening uh, or reporting in at, at this point, right? So um, you can see here, um, I have no active agents, but I have one pending agent. That's the agent that's running on my Famica server there. So I'll just go ahead and get the UID here and activate the agents. So if I do activate again, you can see now that the agent has switched from pending to active. So what this means is that um, my Control center now is in active communication with this agent. So I'm, I'm ready to do stuff, right? So um, one of the protections that, uh, that um, these ransomware frameworks or ransomware attacks uh, have as well is that they will, they will build in their own protection, right? So they, they may assume that you have detected the agent and that you have compromised the agent, right? Like your counterattacks may try to compromise the agent so that you can send a, a payload the, the reverse way, right? Um, basically attacking the attacker, if you will. So um, in order to protect that, typically there will be some sort of exchange of keys between the master and the agent so that, that the master still knows that it can trust the agent. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'll send over the master key uh, so that I know I'm good. All right. So at this point in the attack, my control center is uh, is talking to the agent, the agent is talking to the control center, we're good to go. So I, I can now make that agent do stuff. Uh, that's when the actual attack will happen. And the way that an attack like this uh, takes shape is I have, well, the framework here uses a JSON file, right? And they what they call a policy. And this is the policy to do a full encryption of everything that that is, it's basically a set of instructions, right? Uh, and as you can see here from the bottom, the, that JSON file actually lives on my Racketeer server, uh, Racketeer being the, um, the framework here. So what would a policy like that, the policy, that's the, the, the plan of attack that I, that I mentioned earlier, right? That's everything that I've learned, everything that I need for the attack to happen. Um, so the top section here, that's basically telling the agent, like uh, report back to this, uh, to this external, uh, master, I can have multiple, right? So I can have, I can build in my own redundancy if I will, so that if you were to take down this particular control center, it'll still continue with another control center somewhere else. Um, I'll have the site ID, that's the same UUID. Uh, you may uh, remember that from what I typed in there to, uh, to know what agent I'm talking to. And then there's the master key that will be used for the encryption. This section here is going to contain all the user credentials that I have harvested along the way. In, in my case, um, 
actually, I'll show you that right here. I'll ask the agent for a heartbeat from the control center, right? So the control center um, will ask the agent, uh, can you report back in who you are? Just send me a heartbeat. Uh, so this is the name of the server. Um, this is the user that is uh, that that the agent is running as, right? Because uh, any process runs in a particular user space, and that particular uh, agent of ours runs that as administrator, which is pretty cool, right? So means I have fairly elevated rights on that server. Um, so in this off end section, I would include other credentials that I have harvested along the way, right? Maybe the maybe the password for your Wi-Fi uh, so that I can attack that, or maybe uh, some uh, some Active Directory credentials that I will need for to get the uh, uh, to get on a on a file share, or maybe maybe these are your AWS S3 credentials or your access key and secrets, um, because that's where your your backups are being uh, being held, right? So everything that I have been able to harvest along the way will be in that section here when it comes to credentials, and then in the host session will be every single server that I will attack during this attack. And again, it's an array, so it can be multiple. Uh, in my case, it's just this one server. Um, I will basically impersonate just as the local, whatever the agent is running as, that's what I will be using. And then I have an array of very specific targets that I will target, right? Uh, and because this is a FileMaker server, and again, uh, this is not stuff that I need to sort of like guess at, right? As everything that happened uh, leading up to the attack was taking stock and inventory of what you have. So I already know that your FileMaker server is configured with an additional database folder on the D drive called live files. Uh, I know what the default backups folder is. I know what the default database folder is. Uh, so you have a, a custom backups folder and a custom uh, live files folder. And I'll attack those. That's, that's part of my instructions. And I'll use this encryption key here uh, to do that stuff. All right. So that is the policy, right? That is my plan of attack that I will execute against your server. Um, that's what I put together based on everything that I've learned uh, from you. Type. Right, so uh, back to my control center, uh, it's time to pull the trigger. This is where I will actually execute that plan of attack, right? So I'll do policy exec um, and I'll pick my file. And there it is, it's the full encryption policy, right? So before I send that over, uh, you'll see that happening here, but I'll open up, um, uh, this is another bad one. All right, so this is one of my, uh, this is the, 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 the non-standard backups location. So the custom backup location, this is one of my backups. Um, and this is one of the, these are the backup files that I have in there. Uh, and as you can see, they are now just regular FileMaker files. All right, so if I go back to here and I say, yep, go ahead and send that. So you can see that the agent has received the instructions and the agent is now going through these instructions and um, and you can see that happening in the background there, right? So it's, it's finding the files, it's encrypting the files. So that is the attack uh, in action. And when it's done, it'll basically, um, in the control center, I can basically, whatever I'm seeing here that the agent does, I can see the same thing in my control center uh, if, I, uh, if I want to. Um, I'll let this run. I'll actually go have a quick peek at my live folders. So you can see it's working its way through my live files at this point. And, and again, this is the kind of activity that because we can simulate it, you can now test whether you can actually pick up on the fact that this is happening, right? So that's a crucial part of the defenses. Uh, and I keep coming back to the same thing is know your normal, right? So this is not normal, clearly. Uh, the FileMaker files should not be renaming. The disk activity should be happening. So hopefully you can uh, you can detect that. Um, I have two files that are uh, actively being hosted on that FileMaker server, right? So there's this OAuth tester and the connection test. So I uh, wanted to show you that real quick uh, because, um, and Chris sort of hinted at that, when the attack is done, and the attack is still uh, running here, when, oh, sorry, it is actually done right now. It's going back to sleep mode. So 
in my live files, you can see that all of my FileMaker hosted files have been encrypted at this point, except for this one file that was opened by a FileMaker server, right? The other files in my live uh, uh, folder, they weren't actively opened by FileMaker. I have them on my FileMaker server, but they were not actively being host, hosted. This file was, and you can see that the um, encryption attack actually left it, left it alone. Um, Chris hinted at that because FileMaker server has a lock on a file. Every single file that FileMaker server has hosted is locked by FileMaker server, right? So uh, anything that goes to the file system, the operating system file system to try and manipulate that file will run in, into that wall uh, and FileMaker server will say, oh, the operating system will detect that there's a lock and say, no, you can't touch this file because this process, namely FileMaker server, has a lock on it. So uh, you got to leave it alone. Now, that being said, don't count on that working. Uh, it's not a solid protection against uh, against ransomware attacks on the FileMaker server, right? Uh, this basically just tells us that the the way that my ransomware tool, my agent that does the encryption goes about it, isn't particularly smart. Um, because it does, know, it does not know to handle uh, file locks. Now, there's this utility here called Handle, and it's actually by Microsoft, all right? So I, I can just download that, it's free. I can, I, can, uh, I can roll that into my agents if I'm the attacker. Uh, the interesting here is the fact that uh, using this, I can forcibly uh, basically tell the operating system I know that there's a handle on that file, kill it. Like, uh, just release the handle already, uh, right? So that's why relying on the fact that FileMaker server has the file open and that's enough protection that the encryption cannot touch it, uh, that's not good enough. Uh, that is not going to protect you against the smarter uh, end of the spectrum of the ransomware attacks. And, and uh, they wouldn't all be using this tool like handle. They, the, the really smart ones are actually going to go below the file system uh, and attack the blocks on the on the hard drive instead of trying to talk to the file at the file system level, right? So there's there's a wide spectrum uh, of these tools, and as Chris mentioned in the presentation there, and, and some of the research that Heidi and Chris have done on the dark web, is that there's these tool sets that 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 the people will use to to build ransomware attacks are commodities, right? You can just buy them. They're just pieces of software that you can buy. And like with any software, there's dumb software and there's really sophisticated software. So, uh, uh, so that's something to keep in mind as you, as you, you do that. So don't count on that file lock that FileMaker server has as, having, uh, as being a good enough protection uh, for that stuff. So, um, at this point of the attack, I have encrypted all the files that I can encrypt on your FileMaker server. Um, I'm hoping at this point that you haven't detected that. Um, so when, when you go look at your FileMaker server, everything, I can still, I still have access to my server, right? I can still do things. Um, the last thing that I will do from my control center is um, basically unhide the agent, right? So this is at the point where you lose control of your FileMaker server. And I will say agent self unhide message. If I go back to my server, that's what your server looks like now, right? So there's nothing you can do at this point. You've lost total control over your FileMaker server. This is at the time that you go like, holy crap, right? And, um, and you're done, right? So at this point, it's, uh, um, there's nothing you can do to prevent that anymore because everything is encrypted and you've lost control over that server. Um, this is the time that you would hopefully have a plan somewhere to think about business continuity. One of the slides that Chris ha has, has mentioned is that the average length of a, of a, the duration of an attack is 15 days, that's three weeks, right? So as you now work and deal with this, um, and, and we'll talk about some of the things that there has to be on a plan to do that, but very much part of, of, of the thinking and the plan to deal with this needs to be business continuity, right? Like how is the business going to run while this is happening, right? Is there a plan? Do you have another location to stand up servers? Uh, do you have your backups in, in a good enough state that you can retrieve the backups and, and, and put them up somewhere else while you're dealing with this, right? Because clearly the time it takes dealing with this can be long. And uh, one of the numbers and the stats that we have on the slides is that even if you pay 
the ransom at this point, there's no guarantee that you'll get the files back. Even if you get your files back, you don't know what state they'll be in, right? So there's a lot of unknowns at this point, and you cannot rely on the fact that you'll pay and you'll you'll get everything back in the state that it was before. Got to have a plan for the other part. Chris, back to you. So this is one of Heidi's slides, um, and this is something that um, we've all discussed. And you know, because we're all good and responsible FileMaker developers, we all have uh, disaster recovery plans. And so, to the extent that your plan is you know well thought out and you've figured out contingencies, like what if the person who uh, has the keys to the cloud backup system is on vacation and has his laptop with him or something like that. And so, um, when ransomware attacks happen, everybody kind of drops their silverware and freaks out. You know, it looks like a, a Harry Potter episode when the troll hits. Um, and so, to the extent that you can be ready for this um, and sort of think things through in a calm state of mind, you're going to do way better than if you're just winging it in the moment when everybody's panicking. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't think of in the moment, like communication. Do we need to tell our customers? Do we have cyber security insurance? Do we need to notify them? Do they want to run point on this kind of a thing? Do we have to tell the FBI? Do we need to? you know, notify any medical bodies because we have HIPAA stuff. So just the communications piece of it, you know, maybe you need to loop a company attorney in. So there's all sorts of calm stuff that has to happen. And preferably you hand that off to somebody who's not a technical resource who's going to be, you know, busy trying to get things up and running again. But all this kind of stuff, like who does what, who's in charge of what, you know, how do the different teams communicate among each other, what do you do if someone's out sick, if they're on vacation, you know, um, you know, how do you handle when a, a piece of the team is missing um, or has recently left the company or something like that? Um, so there's all this stuff you have to have, and it's way better to have it figured out ahead of time and tabletop it, you know, actually run it through. You know, now that we have something like Racketeer, you can actually, you know, do a weekend um, assessment and bring a server down and say, okay, come back from that. How are we going to do it? And who's going to do what? And, uh, you know, what happened if this person, you know, tie one arm behind your back, this person's out sick. So now the everybody but that person has to figure out how to do one. And so all that kind of stuff. So just going through this and being familiar with the steps is going to make a world of difference uh, when it actually happens for real. And so we're strongly advocating that people start to get their plans together. And, uh, you know, especially if you look at the outage time, you know, if you're down for three weeks, that's certainly going to get, you know, company leadership's attention. So if you have, you know, uh, upper level management who doesn't see the value in this, just say, okay, uh, what does the cyber insurance company want us to do when this happens? And if they don't know the answer to that, then all of a sudden they're going to get interested in the process pretty quick. So, um, you know, we're, we're advocating that, um, you know, you make a plan for uh, business recovery and uh, run it a few times. And now that we have the ability to actually run it against real hardware and real systems, uh, you can actually find out for certain if your plan is going to work or not. And if it doesn't, then you need to adjust it. So this is, uh, you know, Having these tools and these simulation frameworks gives us the ability to test drive the plan and see if it really does what it's supposed to do. All right, Wim, back to you. Sure. Um, and one of the key things there um, in in what Chris just said, um, and and this is a slide that typically Heidi covers, um, the the aftermath. Uh, and getting the plan together, it's not a single person thing, right? This does, this does, this does not fall on the shoulders of the pharmacy developer, right? So the plan needs to be such that it involves um, a, a pretty big team, right? Like I just mentioned, that while this is happening, you have to have a team working on, on the business continuity side, setting up parallel infrastructure so that the business can continue while there's another team handling the communications and, and the negotiations and, and all of that stuff. There's probably an, another team 
working on on trying to figure out in the existing infrastructure what can what can be salvaged at the same time, right? So there's a lot of things going on um, at the same time, and that's why we cannot all be running around like chickens who have just got their heads cut off, right? So it's got to be something that you can pull out procedures, follow procedures, uh, follow the plan, right? Um, and in making the plan, there's um, just like we have this framework that we've just shown for, for how to simulate an attack, there's other frameworks that will guide you through everything that you need to think about uh, to prepare. And, and the NIST one is a really good one. Uh, there's other ones, but the NIST one is, is particularly good um, so that you can think about every single column that's on there um, and, um, and brainstorm and figure out what's there. What is it that we need to do? Does this apply to us? And, and if it applies to us, what is it that we have to put together to uh, to do that? All right. So, uh, um, so it's uh, just follow one of these frameworks. Uh, there's really, really good ones out there that uh, that will take a lot of the guesswork uh, out of trying to come up with a complete plan. So, um, as I mentioned earlier in the the deck, you know, one sort of key area of interest to us is. You know, what are the attack surfaces on a FileMaker server? How can we protect them? Um, you know, the, the, the biggies are the databases folder where your live databases are and your backup directories. And, you know, backup is, it could be kind of an extended concept because you have your, you know, immediate backup directory, but then you might have processes that move it off to a network backup or you might move it to uh, cloud backups and so, so on and so forth. So we would be interested in protecting all of that. Um, as we mentioned, if you don't know what your normal functioning system looks like and behaves like, um, you're not going to be able to detect a deviation from that norm. So, um, you need to get systems in place to know what your baseline functionality looks like. And to do that, you want to have some kind of monitoring uh, system. You'd want to have a, a Zabbix or you want to have a, a, what's known as a SEAM, a Security Incident Event Management System that aggregates logs from different servers and uh, can find patterns for you and say, hey, this looks fishy. So there are templates out there that says, hey, if I see event A and event B and event C, and it might be my domain controller has just created an account on a local file server and it's accessing a hidden share and it's doing privilege escalation, you know, those events might have occurred across multiple machines, but taken in the aggregate, they look fishy. And so for you, you know, it, it's hard you know, people don't look at this stuff half the time. We're busy, you know, dealing with, you know, uh, feature requests or help desk tickets or whatever it is. Who's got time to scrutinize the, the baseline functionality of the network and the system? And so you need to have automated systems in place to keep an eye on this stuff for you and at least give you a heads up when something looks out of order. So uh, there's tons of stuff, out, you know, you can certainly find paid solutions, but there's also a lot of, you um, uh, open source software that can do this kind of stuff for you. And we'll, there's some of that stuff in some of the resource links that we've shared. Um, so some ideas we came up with, like, well, how would we uh, protect a FileMaker uh, databases folder? And so we thought of this idea, what if we created a whitelist and, you know, we have a config file stash somewhere that says, here are the 10 databases that I host. And if you see anything other than that in that folder, sound the alarm. So, for example, when uh, Wim just ran the racketeer simulation, uh, as those databases were getting encrypted, a brand new file was created and it had a .enc uh, file extension on the end of it. If we had uh, a whitelist on that folder and those things started to get created, that should immediately sound an alarm and you know, page you or email you or whatever happens. Um, send you a text. So that kind of thing was interesting to us. Um, Heidi was able to do something like that using PowerShell, but PowerShell is kind of tricky because A, as part of your defenses, you probably don't want to have PowerShell on in the first place because that's used by the bad guys to get up to no good. And um, B, if they do turn it on, then they're obviously working in PowerShell and could see uh, what you might be up to. So while PowerShell works, um, you know, for all the reasons that Wim talked about earlier, is that they, these can be compromised by, you know, sophisticated pieces of ransomware software. Uh, it's certainly not bulletproof, but uh, it, it, it could help. And so we're sort of advocating, you know, throw everything 
and the kitchen sink at this problem. So, you know, you might set up, you know, a dozen defenses and nine of them get taken out. But if three or, or even one is left standing and gives you a, an early warning, totally worth it, right? You know, uh, you don't know uh, what's going to come at you. And this software is changing all the time. They have so much money coming at them that they can afford to be in continuous development and continuous improvement. So um, this stuff is evolving so rapidly that you just never know uh, what sort of things will work and not work over time. Um, other things that you might look at, and again, these are, you know, just very crude sorts of uh, tools. You know, I wouldn't rely on these as your, your your uh, surefire solution, but just things that, you know, could help you detect an attack, you know, sudden disk space usage. If you're encrypting files, all of a sudden, um, this is going to take processor activity because that's a, a processor intensive uh, activity to do encryption. Uh, you're going to have sudden disk space yo-yoing as files are encrypted and then deleted and things like that. Um, if you can detect the, um, Disabling the antivirus software, anti malware software, you know, that should be sending alarms. Um, and then just basic stuff that probably everybody knows they should do, but hardly anyone ever does is test your backups. You know, when was the last time you went and said, you know, if I had to recover from a backup, does it work? Do I have any uh, corruption in the database? And so if I were to spin up a new, say, AWS FileMaker server and threw one of my backups on there, is that going to come up okay? Good to know, right? And with some of the newer automation tools out in the file American community, like Auto, where you can automatically provision a piece of software, grab a backup, stand it up. You know, you could do automated testing of this stuff. And you know, if you don't have to have a human being thrown at this task, you could, on a daily basis, say, "Hey, spin up a server, throw my backup on there, stand up the backup, and make sure everything's working okay." And as soon as you get the all clear, then you know shut it all down and decommission the the cloud-based server you know that could happen in a matter of minutes and not cost you hardly anything at all in terms of aws fees um but we're not doing it right? this is the kind of thing that we should be doing now that we have the capability to do stuff like this you know this should absolutely be considered a best practice where you're testing your backups and making sure your recovery plan works um, another thing uh, up in the top right corner here is immutable backups. And so this is a feature of Amazon, but it's actually a feature of Mac OS. On a Mac, you can say, I want to make this file immutable. It is not changeable unless I, you know, change an attribute first. Um, this would prevent a file from being encrypted. And so if you make your Amazon backups immutable, even if you have a jump point on your network and you've been completely infiltrated by malware and they are able to get to Amazon, if you've set it to be immutable, then they're not going to be able to uh, take that out from under you. And so this uh, vastly improves your um, resiliency. So sort of the two big takeaways, you know, for me personally, that I'd like you to walk away with tonight is turn on encryption at rest on all your databases so that if they get exfiltrated, they can't be broken into and use immutable backups. So that even if they get to your backups, they won't be able to take that away from you as a means of recovering from an attack. And so if you do those two things, you'll, you know, it's still going to suck, but you'll probably be able to come out the other side of it. Okay. You might have lost some work depending on how frequently you back up, but uh, you will be able to recover. Um, some of this other stuff is, uh, you know, super specific, uh, disable the VSS admin tool. Uh, to prevent ransomware from deleting shadow volume copies. Uh, the script host and PowerShell shut those off. Um, email, you know, something super basic like who are we going to notify? You know, if you have an IT department, you know, don't send a notice to one person. What if they're out? Send it to, you know, shotgun everybody so that, you know, all hands on deck get the alarm when something goes wrong. Um, you can use an application control uh, program to keep an eye on, you know, new executables. Have I seen this before? What is this? You know, some agent starts running. It's going to likely be running as an executable. And then you want to, um, you know, increase your company's um, posture, I guess I would say, about email phishing. So there are um, companies like Know Before, which is a a uh, company that will actually run your employees through uh, phishing campaigns and actually just blanket you 
you and your employees with uh, phishing emails and anybody who clicks on a phishing link, which would be the gateway to getting malware on your network, you know, then you have remedial training and say, let's try and get our percentages down so that, um, you know, it's probably going to be impossible to get everybody down to 100% success of, you know, screening for phishing emails and not clicking on them. But the lower you can get those numbers, the better your chances are of not getting attacked in the first place. The obvious one is unpatched software, you know, these zero days, um, you know, a zero day by definition is something that no one's seen yet and no one knows about. But once these things are out there, the companies tend to patch them. And if you're not keeping up with your software patching, then you're just asking for trouble. And then uh, weak passwords, kind of a classic. But the RDP stuff, and this is sort of a, a broader issue of remote access. You know, one thing that the pandemic did was accelerate work from home stuff. So in a huge rush, people sent everybody home, stood up a bunch of remote access endpoints. Um, you know, maybe the job was done well, or maybe it was a rush job. And, um, you know, who's to say that anyone's gone back over all those uh, remote access deployments and made sure that everything's nice and tight and that we don't have any loose ends and there's no way that any of these connections be can be compromised. So all of a sudden organizations around the world have really uh, opened up the remote access possibilities. So each one of those, it, you know, is a potential door into your system by malware. And so, you know, this is outside the remit of your average FileMaker developer, but for those of you who work in IT organizations, you know, this is absolutely something you should be thinking of. So, all right. Uh, what kind of uh, research have we done? Wim's shown what he's done with Racketeer. Wim, do you have anything to add in terms of, you know, using Racketeer against running databases and, you know, any results to share with, you know, what happens if the database is running and I encrypt it and then I decrypt it? What kind of state is it in? Usually it's going to be, uh, depending if you run the, the, the dumb version, it's pretty binary, right? Either FileMaker server has the file locked or it doesn't. If the file isn't locked, then it's fair game. It'll end up encrypted and, and decrypted, and that's just fine. Uh, the worst thing that can happen, of course, is that when you have an encrypted file and then you start to manipulate it yourself and then it's, it, it, it's, uh, it tries to get decrypted in the middle of some other uh, manipulation. So any process, whether it's it's the, in the decrypting or the encrypting phase, has the potential because it's rewriting blocks in the file, it has the potential for uh, uh, for damaging the file, right? So, um, so what, while it would be nice to get your files back in a, in a decrypted state, um, the immutable backups that Chris mentioned, those are really going to be your best protection, right? So, um, of course, you would try to get your files decrypted and then inspect them as uh, to see what they are. Uh, but uh, but don't count on them. Uh, one of the things that we mentioned in in knowing your normal is the increased activity for processor and disk activity that comes with encrypting the files. The more modern uh, ransomware doesn't try to encrypt the whole file anymore. They they basically encrypt every every twenty fourth bit or something like that, right? Because it doesn't matter that the whole file is encrypted. Even if only a little bit of it is encrypted, you can't use that file, right? It it doesn't it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, so these things get get smarter and smarter. Uh, the more the more uh, defenses, um, or or the more that they're out there in the wild. And if we take anything back from that miter attack vector, it's the 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 sheer amount of layers that there are to these attack and. Uh, to Chris, Chris's point and, and what Heidi and Chris were discovering together is the uh, in, in these best practices and the way that you you try to defend, you have to have the same number of layers, right? So it's not a it's not a, a oh, I'll, I'll install Norton antivirus on my server and I'm done. No, that's a single layer of defense. That's not going to be good enough, right? So uh, so the, you got to have those multiple layers. And we've talked about best practices and we we don't need to reinvent a whole slew of best practices to to uh, to help protect us against this right a lot of these things that we are talking about today are exactly the same things that we have been talking about for a long time uh, but then in the context of maybe a theoretical attack or maybe from a disaster recovery point of view but these things come together in the ransomware attacks and they, they are if there's something that 
hopefully you remembered from the beginning of the presentation is these things are not theoretical anymore, right? So they, they are bound to happen um, and they will take companies. So uh, so all of these best practices become more relevant and more urgent to uh, to revisit them and um, and look at them. That was a segue uh, as to as to what what happens on on the on the FileMaker server. Um, one of the things that I that we talked about is that lock that FileMaker server has. Um, when you take down the handle, it, like if you forcibly tell the operating system release that handle that that's on on the server, uh, chances are that your FileMaker server is not going to take that very well, right? So I've seen FileMaker server crash when that happens. Um, so that act of FileMaker server crashing, if that happens on the very first file that gets attacked, that may damage the rest of your files, right? As Chris said. Kind of depends on what state you're in. If the file is under heavy transactional load um, and a lot of this stuff is happening and all of a sudden FileMaker server loses control of that file, that file is going to be in a, bit, in a pretty bad state, right? So, um, so, so be prepared for the whole spectrum of a file coming out of the decryption totally fine and, and a file not even being encrypted because, because the handle, uh, uh, it gets forcibly released, but the file being totally toast just by by doing that right so uh so it can really be any state right and, and there's another possibility which is that the agent sees that it runs in you know it, it, the the sophistication of these things is always evolving so i don't know that any of this is happening right now but i can certainly imagine a near future where it does where um the agent encounters a share lock it says something's got this. It takes an inventory of running processes and starts to shut those processes down. So it could detect FileMaker server. You know, it could just say shut down everything, including FileMaker server. And then as soon as FileMaker server goes down, the share lock is done, and then it would be successful. And you know, in some ways, that's a little more uh, ideal, just because that theoretically FileMaker would FileMaker server would gracefully close the file as opposed to just having handle rip the lock off of it. But uh, you know, still problematic, but uh, so, yeah, I, and that gets to the second bullet. You know, we're talking about detecting and blocking security changes on these directories, so we can say, hey, make it, you know, set the uh, security on this directory so that something like an agent wouldn't be able to do this. None of these are really bulletproof. I don't have a lot of faith in the durability of these things to withstand a sophisticated ransomware attack. So these were. Some of the stuff we were just sort of kicking around, like what could we do to, you know, really protect the databases and backups folder? You know, Heidi and I were sitting in Wim's treehouse and we eating canapes and just riffing on what could we possibly do. And Wim was saying, you know, some of these things even operate below the level of the file system. You know, they're at a rootkit. And we started thinking about that idea. You know, there is some sophisticated. Uh, security software that protects against ransomware attacks that also runs at the root level. Um, and, and when you're at root, you know, you're sort of co-equal with the operating system itself. So you are operating below the level of the operating system rules. And so kind of all bets are off. And so we thought, well, if the security software, you know, the high-end security software can do this and the bad guys can do this, Maybe we could try fighting fire with fire. What if we used a rootkit to protect the database and backup directories? And so um, we found a rootkit out there called R77. If you just Google R77 rootkit, you'll find it. There's a GitHub repo for it. And, um, you know, it has a bunch of characteristics. So just, you know, it's name is due to the fact that if you put a $77 prefix on any file, it sort of hides itself from the, the file system. And so this gets into a question of how enumeration works on malware. So you have this agent out there and it's sort of poking around and it's trying to get a list like, what do we have here? What do I want to encrypt? You know, that process of, you know, building that uh, library of stuff is called enumeration. And so how does it do that? If it's using the file system to do that, you know, maybe it's operating, um, you know, conducting itself below the level of the operating system. That seems harder than it needs to be, though. I would think it would probably just use the file system or, you know, DIR or anything like that to say, hey, what files are there that I should be encrypting? If it's doing that, we can actually inoculate those processes against that level of detection 
Um, and uh, Heidi has actually done this with R77. She modified R77 to do this. So uh, let me show you what she's got. Uh, we recorded this. So I'll just sort of run you through the video and you can kind of see what that looks like. So let me click on this. So the starting state here is that we have a FileMaker server. It's not running. And the reason we have it starting out not running is we wanted to prove to everybody that if we hide this stuff, you know, if you hide the databases folder, how's FileMaker server going to know where the databases are? And so you can be very surgical with how you run this and say, I want to hide this from the file system, but FileMaker server can still see the stuff it needs to see. So you have this sort of selective vision loss where FileMaker server can see, but other things can't see. So that's why we're starting off with uh, the database server down. So let's just start it. We can see that uh, FileMaker server is not running. We're going to switch over to the registry. And these are, let me just pause here for a second. These are the settings for uh, R77. So R77 creates its own registry keys when you install it and says, Okay, what do you want me to do? And so we can sort of give it air quotes, a hit list of things we want to essentially apply an invisibility cloak to. So we're going to say, hey, we want FileMaker server, the entire directory to make itself invisible. So we're going to throw the cloak over that. So let's run that. We're going to say FileMaker server gets hidden. So now this is the test console. This is the R77 console when you actually execute the thing. We can say, hey, um, notice that there's a column here called inject. So these are the processes that are running. I could inject, you know, these hides to any of these processes. So if I click go ahead, it's going to go down to explorer and inject. And now if we run the file explorer and we open up program files, FileMaker server is gone. There was a FileMaker server there before. And so now if we uninject, and now it's back. And so this notion that we can use this rootkit, which is operating below the level of the file system, even though it's actually talking to it, but it's, uh, I don't know what to call it, base of power, or base of operations is outside the operating system, even though it's using some of the infrastructure, of the operating system to be managed, um, can actually hide and, uh, obscured, you know, the FileMaker server itself, any backup folders you want to give it and stuff like that. So that's the file system that Heidi was injecting uh, the Explorer. And so now, poof, it can just make it disappear. So that's dead simple. And so then this, the command prompt, is actually a different process. This is not the file Explorer. So if we want to do it to command, we're going to have to inject it to command. And now if we do a DIR, so I just want to pause it here a second. So notice when we did it before, it would actually see, air quotes, see FileMaker server. Now that we've injected it, FileMaker server is invisible to this process. So to my mind, this is the process that something like a, a malware agent would use to do its enumeration and say, okay, where's the stuff I want to hit? Uh, if you have injected um, the command line with, um, R77 to apps, you know, just make FileMaker completely invisible to it. Um, I think you have a good chance of, uh, you know, surviving a ransomware attack, or at least, you know, the ransomware attack might hit the rest of the server, but the FileMaker stuff uh, might be protected from it. And so there are um, implications to this, right? So if the FileMaker uh, or if the file system and File Explorer can't see this, how do you put up new databases? How do you like, you know, you know, bring down a file for to work offline on it and things like that? Because you have this um, console here to actually operate the thing, you can inject and uninject, you know, detach the injection from it. So if you need to do day-to-day -day maintenance, you know, typically we don't spend a ton of time, at least I don't, in the FileMaker admin console. If I need to look and see if something's, you know, acting up, I'll go have a look at it. But to actually work with files, I tend to do it pretty seldom. So this gives you kind of the best of both worlds where uh, in ordinary operation, everything is completely hidden. And then if you need to do anything, you know, where you're actually manipulating files, you just detach the injection, do whatever you need to do, and then re-inject it. And so the result of that is 99.99% of the time, 
FileMaker server and its files are completely invisible to any process that might try and take inventory of it. So I think this is super cool and, you know, a, a real possibility in terms of protecting a FileMaker server. And so then we, we've injected this, but now we're starting FileMaker server. And because we haven't injected the FileMaker server process, it can see its kids as it were. So if we were to open the databases folder, we'd see the sample file running there. So here we are in FileMaker Pro, logging on to the FileMaker server. And so FileMaker server is functioning as expected. You know, this is normal operation, even though the command line and the uh, file explorer cannot see the entire FileMaker server uh, directory and everything in it. So pretty darn cool if you ask me. I'm gonna stop there. Um, and in the interest of time, let's just sort of get back onto our regular stuff. Um, yeah, so we're getting to the end here. Let me just hit play again. So, to date, most of the ransomware is targeted at Windows ecosystems. So Windows servers, uh, you know, they know exactly what a SQL server looks like and stuff like that. Um, again, this is anecdotal, but they don't seem to be super aware of FileMaker server. So uh, we don't see anything targeted at a FileMaker server. Um, if you are hosting your FileMaker server on macOS or Linux, that gives you some measure of protection just because ransomware isn't um, tending to target those operating systems. Uh, some people we've talked to who have hosted on macOS said their macOS server was completely unscathed, even though the rest of the network, all the Windows machines on the network were attacked by ransomware. I wouldn't rely on that as you know solid protection for the long term. It probably helps you out now and maybe a year from now, but probably not much longer than that. Um, same with Linux. Linux variants are not common, but they're growing. Um, I just saw something. Uh, who was it? Veronis, uh, one of those uh, endpoint protection companies uh, who actually uh, screen your email for phishing attacks, say they are seeing a pretty significant uptick in phishing attacks that target Mac OS and Linux machines. Uh, I want to say the number is like 25% higher in the month of September than in previous months. So this stuff is definitely on the rise. Um, you know, it's nowhere near the level of Windows stuff is yet, but um, it, it, it's becoming more common. Uh, we strongly recommend phishing awareness training like no before. Uh, we have that in the links. Um, on Mac OS, there is a freeware product called Ransomware from a company called Objective-C, Patrick Wardle. Um, this is like a little widget. You can run it on your Mac, and if anything tries to encrypt a file on your Mac, it's going to say, hey, over there, something's trying to encrypt something. Do you want to allow that to happen or not? And it'll interrupt the process and make you approve it before it proceeds. And so I tend to see that in stuff like Adobe, like if you install Adobe Reader or something. Uh, those sorts of things tend to trip it, and you can just allow it to happen. But um, this thing's free. I would absolutely recommend that people use that if they're running Mac OS. And then good logging practices. One of the things we saw at uh, DEF CON was a guy named Jake Williams. He goes, his Twitter handle is MalwareJake if you want to follow him. Um, you know, the default sizes, I think, for most logs on Windows and servers in general is like 20 megabytes or something. He's like, man, if you have the real estate to do it, 100 meg, 500 meg, you know, crank those logs up. He said, no incident responder ever said, what am I going to do with all these logs? So uh, make your logs as big as you can get them so that they don't age out after, uh, you know, some of these that have a lot of traffic on them. You know, they'll roll over every hour or two or something like that on a busy server. So you want to get these things as large as you can and use log aggregation tools like a seam. Um, I mentioned some of these on the next slide here. So um, Alien Vault is one, the Elk Stack from Elastic. These will aggregate your logs and also give you the ability to sort of look for fishy looking um events that in the aggregate look off to them and so they will do some early detection for you um 
and Zabbix and Splunk and New Relic, all these things, you know, monitoring tools that you possibly are already using generate logs. You want to gather up all these logs and run them through um, a processor that will analyze them for suspicious activities. Uh, let's see. Um, if you do get hit by ransomware, you should know that there are a ton of decryptors out there. They may or may not work for you, likely probably won't work, but just the fact that they exist, you should absolutely give them a try. So Kaspersky has some, Avast has some, uh, No More Ransom has some. I think um, some of the federal agencies also list some decryptors, but you should, uh, if you just do a Google search for ransomware decryptors, um, if you need them, I'd give them a try. These things are probably updated all the time, so I don't know that it's going to benefit you to just sort of grab them right now and keep them on hand as a library. You'd probably want to try the latest and greatest at the moment you need it. But uh, just a, an additional thought to um, you know have in your bag of tricks. Um, as far as uh, recovery planning, you know this is by no means an exhaustive list, but you know you should um, you know absolutely start writing one if you haven't already think about what should be on it you know what what's the goal of the thing you know to my mind you want it, the goal should be to get back up and running and operating again as an organization uh, like you were before the thing but you know is there some level of damage that you can take you know if we lose two hours of work would we be okay with that um, if we lose, you know, a day of work or two days of work, you know, what, what's the maximum amount of pain you can take, you know, within reason? Because, you know, the less pain you incur, the more expensive it's going to be to set yourself up for success for that. So um, you're going to have to have a lot more infrastructure to say, I don't want to lose anything more than five minutes. So you're going to have to have massive amount of storage and uh, a lot of redundancy in order to be able to do something like that. So. Who's on the team? What's their contact information? What do you do if they're not around? Um, you know, can you verify that you are able to restore from the most recent available backup? You know, do you have any means of figuring out how much data was lost? So if you think about something like a factory and you have jobs going out onto a floor and then all your systems go down, how do you know where to start again? If you have to roll to a backup, you have the, you know, some number of jobs that are in this no man's land where your recovered system from the backup doesn't know about those jobs, but they actually tangibly exist. How do you handle that kind of thing? Do you just make a gap in your uh, numbering system and say, okay, let's jump ahead 100 and we'll figure out where to slot these, you know, existing ones in there somehow manually. You know, you got to figure all that out because those things are, you know, in the works. They're actually running as a job on the factory floor. So you need to figure out how to do stuff like that where your system doesn't match, you know, your printed output and your stuff that's in production. Um, you know, credentials, obviously, you've been compromised. So somebody uh, got a hold of credentials. You need to very quickly change all your credentials before you bring anything back up because otherwise you might just recreate the problem by bringing something up from a backup. You know, you might have restored a compromised operating system. Um, you know, do you have any means of verifying your server machine? Can you, you know, say without a shadow of a doubt, no, this server does not have any rootkit on it and no longer poses a threat on the network? I, I think uh, that's pretty difficult to say with certainty. And so, you, if you, to the extent that you have hardware on prem, you probably want to replace that hardware on prem and not trust it anymore. Um, and if you're bringing up new servers or you're spinning up a new cloud instance, how do you get the word out to all your users and say, okay, here's our new infrastructure that we're using in the meantime while we, you know, restore all the stuff from the other stuff. Uh, your domain names servers, you know, if you have to stand up a new email server, you know, you got to repoint all that stuff. So there's going to be some latency for some of these things and you should probably figure out which things are going to be the slowest and get started on those first. You know, it's like timing a meal when you're preparing multiple dishes for a big dinner or something like that. Uh, figure out your choke points and uh, jump on those right away. Um, these are some of the resources that we handed in prior to this. And I think those are on the link in the chat. Um, so you don't need to, if you want to take a screenshot, feel free, but I think you have these in the chat link. And then this is just one final thing uh, I wanted to throw out there, and I titled this some encouraging sign. 
signs. Um, there does seem to have been some, you know, nation state action against them ransomware people. Uh, they were freaking out at the end of October. If you go find this tweet, it's kind of interesting where um, the Revo ran uh, ransomware gang was attacked. Um, a bunch of affiliates have been arrested. Six million, six million dollars is, you know, a drop in the bucket compared to all the money these guys have made, but it's something. So, um, several of the ransomware gang members have been arrested and some of them are being extradited. So, uh, it seemed like for a long time, like the last couple of years that these people were operating with relative impunity. And it seems like very recently in the last 60 days, there has actually been some movement against these folks. So it's encouraging and maybe it'll slow this down a lot um, or, or slow it down some, but um, I just thought it was a positive development where it seemed very inevitable that we we're all gonna get creamed by these guys in short order. But it seems like, uh, you know, some of these governments and uh, cyber commands are biting back. And so uh, it remains to be seen what sort of effect that'll have. But this is our last slide. Wim, do you have any additional thoughts? Um, just some uh, closing thoughts and, and uh, bringing it back to what we can do as family developers. A couple of things that, that Chris has mentioned in the last couple of slides, um, and, and obviously we, we've said it a few times, know your normal and knowing your normal very often comes from the logs that that are available, and the operating system has some some one, but Famica Server has some really interesting logs as well, right? And um, as a Famica developer, for instance, one of the simple things we can do is take a look at that event log once in a while. Uh, I've come I come across that very often when uh, there's a a solution being deployed, and then uh, schedules are being used or perform script on service being used, but the scripts themselves haven't been tailored. To, uh, to to take take into account that the FileMaker service scripting engine doesn't do all all the stuff that the client does. So the logs are flooded with with errors that are somewhat harmless and meaningless, but they flood the logs. And to Chris's point earlier, FileMaker server keeps a default log size. If you don't change that, you may be drowning your log in meaningless data that obscures the data that you're really after. And that just makes it harder to get to know your log. Right, so so that's one of the simple things as Pharmaca developer that we can help in making sure that enough relevant information is available uh, for for when we need it. Um, and in the realm of encouraging signs, um, I think the progress that AI and spe specifically ML machine learning has made in recent years can really help in interpreting those logs. Right, um, when, when we say know your normal. What does that even mean? Right? It means knowing what is a pattern of activity that is that is normal for, for your uh, environment. And that is going to be different than if you take the same solution or or a different solution into a different environment with different user base and, and all of that stuff. Right. So uh, just saying, for instance, a a typical average processor activity of 10 percent may be very normal for one deployment and totally abnormal in another one. Right. So. Uh, so the advances that are being made with machine learning can really help us detect, uh, not not detect, but first establish what the pattern is, the normal pattern, and then uh, figure out what some, what some of the anomalies could be. Uh, Chris had, had on a slide some some log aggregators uh, like Splunk or New Relic. Some of these commercial services that can aggregate all your logs already offer some of that functionality where they can let loose on with ML models. Uh, to to help you figure out uh, in an automated fashion what is normal and what is not normal. Just like as what Chris said is some of the um, some of the the backup testing, for instance, everything that has to do with AWS, Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft Azure, anything that is infrastructure as code is something that that we can automate, and that's where we as developers can come into play, where we can say, well. It's tedious to go and figure out if the backup is valid, but we can automate that um, because it's it's you can completely in an automated fashion stand up a server, assign it a big hard drive, assign it um, fast processors, move the files to it, run run some scripts that you want to run, and then tear that server back down. You're renting that server for the I don't know for the hour that you're using it, right? So why not make it a really good one uh, for the time that you need it? And again, the key point here is it's all 
it's all within the realm of automation. You can all script all of that good stuff. Um, so there's a lot we can do there as Hamaka developers to help prepare for this. Uh, basically throwing, sometimes it'll feel like that, but basically just throwing some more barricades up, right? Make it more difficult for, for these things to get through. Um, but that's, uh, to some extent, that's the name of the game. Just make it harder uh, because we, we know that we uh, cannot completely prevent it. All right, so I'm looking through the chat here. Uh, are we sharing our slides? Yeah, we can post our slide deck. Uh, Tony said in a previous presentation, you mentioned that malware often start by encrypting backups and then attacking the live files. One of the issues with off machine backups is that the recovery is slower than local backups. In order to protect local backups, might you send a hash of the local files to and the offsite system to compare and alert? So that almost sounds like a um, like a a check bit or something like that. To, to yeah, know. if you if you had because uh, what I was thinking here is that if you start with an assumption that the you know the primary volume is going to be completely hacked by clever people who'll take over everything, then the idea you know of an offsite system that let's just say won't get hacked, possibly because it's you know very locked down and it's just taking input, so you know, just hash the files and say, if, if, if the offsite thing is kind of keeping track of what it's supposed to be going on on the machine you're watching, you just send a hash because it's lightweight and compare and say, hey, you know, the something's changed. The file name, it's got a suffix or there's been a, a change to the hash of the file. Anyway, My, you, and unless they hack, unless they hack the thing that's sending the hash, it's, it's just an idea to ask a good question here. Yep. Uh, the the uh, if if I I'm I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Uh, you, there's a logical flaw in the thinking there. Perhaps Tony is the fact that you know, an offsite backup takes longer to restore. That is under the assumption that you're restoring to the same place as as you uh, as you currently have. Uh, very likely, if you're under attack, that's not going to be the place, right? And again, uh, things like Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, and uh, Microsoft Azure can really help with that. Um, we talked about this before the meeting a little bit. Um, you can do backups without physically moving the files, right? You can do volume-based uh, uh, snapshots. All of the Google, all of the cloud providers do that, and and moving that, attaching it to a new instance is it's not instantaneous, but it doesn't take the same amount of time as it would take to physically copy files across the network to a hard drive. So, so the restore doesn't need to necessarily be slow, even if you have the the backup. In whatever shape, whether it's the files or the whole volume, in a completely different location. Um, th that's an absolutely fair point. Uh, what I was thinking about it as like an early warning system, you know, from a previous presentation, I think it was one of Chris's where he was like, you know, they're gonna sneak up on you by taking your backups, you know, your backups out, and then if you if you notice that the hash has changed, it's like, uh oh, they're coming to get me, and then you respond at that point. Uh, but in terms of I think, Wim, if I take your point, the, um, you know, if the whole machine is toast, then um, spinning up a, a fresh from the uh, immutable backup, that can be done fast if, you, if you've got strong DevOps skills. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, to, uh, Chris mentioned that in, in one of the last slides there. Um, unless you can be certain that your old infrastructure is safe, uh, which is a very, very tough thing. I don't think many of us are capable of making that 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 determination. Uh, you're not going to restore your old stuff, right? So you're going to set up completely new parallel infrastructure. Um, th there's a reason why 80% of those uh, that got attacked got attacked again, right? Because if you restore to the same machines, uh, even if you wipe them, if you restore to the same machines, Chances are there's something in there lurking that is going to uh, come right back at you, right? So, um, uh, so, so yeah, it's it's definitely yeah, a factor. More, I mean, just 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 early warning, and you know, obviously, it'd be a sophisticated approach for anyone to take. And you know, I don't think people are going to be building their own um, monitoring systems, their own you know watchers. Um, be more of a service, but uh, anyway, interesting uh, challenges. That you guys presented. All right, shall we stop the recording?
Oh, I don't know. Are there, are there any other questions? Well, I have a question. Maybe it's a question slash comment, but uh, first off, thank you for uh, this discussion. I've listened uh, uh, to Chris and Heidi on, on a couple other sessions on this and every time I pick up something new. So I appreciate that. Um, your comment that 80, 84% or whatever of, uh, of ransom sites get re ransomed is, uh, is actually scary because, you know, I can only imagine the, the sense of panic when everything is down and how quickly we want to get it back up. But, but at the same time, we're bringing things up. We need to know how we got ransom. What was the root cause? Not who did it, but what, you know, what, what got broken and, uh, be worried about, um, uh, they're, they're looking at me right now. And so we got, we got to have our heads kind of spinning in circles. And, and so that, I think that's, that's scary, but my question is, um, and, and, and I point maybe at the AWSs and, and, uh, Azure and those sorts of things is there, we, we've talked about becoming our own system, you know, basically here, you got to be either your own system administrator, if you're running your own servers or. You're now in deep in the shorts of your customer servers and their IT department, which um, you know is going to have their own procedures and processes, and perhaps you know be equally as concerned about the ransom, not just for file maker server, but maybe something else got corrupted. Um, so it, it's it's just really really complicated for a developer of FileMaker <laughs> to get our arms around this, right? And to know that we're do we can't just do it halfway; we got to do it all the way. So I guess my 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 my, my hope is. Um, uh, is, is there something that the, the AWSs or Azures are doing, uh, much as Tony just said, which is kind of that early warning or that, you know, uh, ransomware prevention as a service, uh, something that, uh, you know, because this is not unique to FileMaker. This is, this is affecting all kinds yeah. of platforms. Wouldn't you want to? Uh, sure. Business opportunity. Yeah. yeah. The, um, uh, all of these cloud providers have um, what they call the shared responsibility model, right? There's a lot of stuff that they do um, for the things that they can control. Uh, and if you look at a FileMaker server, um, th obviously they control the, the virtualization and, and the physical hardware and, and the access to the hardware and, uh, and to some extent the patching, the installation of, this, of the operating system and whatever tools that they put on there. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff that, that, uh, that they have no control over. Uh, the, the settings that you change on the operating system, the, the, the software that you put on there. Uh, so there's always going to be that mix of, of responsibilities um, between that. But they definitely will offer you a vast set of tools that you would not have if you just had a non-premise server, right? So uh, they offer services, they offer tools, they offer um, things like, uh, like uh, CloudWatch or anything like that. Uh, or even CloudFormation to just quickly build a, a lot of these things. So that there's a lot more tools and services that that you have with them uh, that you wouldn't have if if you um, if you if you're on your own with with your own service. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm uh, I guess yet another thing to go learn about, right? It just yeah. seems like, and and I appreciate that it's a shared responsibility, but in the context of being able to spin up a new virtual machine, and know what um, they don't know, they don't know specifically what you modified, but they have copies of the data, right? And so we, we we call them backups, but they might call it you know something grander than that, and and just a way of them helping more rapidly restore in a uh, in a development environment where we can change uh, you know security and you know in a non-public environment. So we can change the access and security and then bring that public. It seems like that, and, and maybe what Chris has got here, ransomware is a service detection. I'm talking about the service repair, not you know, because we know we, we know we got it when we got it. So yeah. it's really the repair side of it. No, it, it's you know, there's a huge variety of situations here where some of us might have primary IT roles, but a lot of us, you know, just own a small part of the IT, right? You know, uh responsibility, if you will. And so, you know, the, the best thing we can do is say, you know, be the canary in the coal mine, say that this is a rising threat, you know, this should be a problem. Maybe encourage them to do tabletop exercises and say, hey, when was the last time you did a resiliency drill? You know, I'd like to be included. 
make sure that the FileMaker server can come up, you know, as desired and, and just get people thinking about stuff like that and re referring them to resources. Uh, there's tons of them. But um, a lot of people have cyber insurance these days, and those people have very strong opinions about how stuff should be done and, you know, how frequently you should be doing these uh, resiliency checks and stuff like that. And so even just asking the question like, hey, uh, what sort of requirements do you have for your cyber policy? Uh, might get them to look at it and go, ooh, we should be doing something just to you know, run in drills, et cetera. So uh, I, I think just raising awareness of the issue is a, a useful public service in and of itself, even though that, you know, ultimately we're not going to have, you know, the lion's share responsibility for some of the response to this. We can, so I, I think we should focus on protecting the FileMaker server and, you know, stick to our knitting, as it were. Yeah, great. Thank you. Now, I remember when uh, some people used to suspect that that the companies that provided uh, antivirus software were also the ones pro providing the viruses. I mean, is it, are we finding, is, you think it's possible that the case where a lot of these people are providing the, the ransomware protection tools or, or the same people who are also committing the ransom, ransomware attacks? I wouldn't think so. I mean, a lot of these are, I, I, I think some of these uh, are nation states now, like North Korea, China, Russia, places like that. The Russians seem to operate with impunity inside of Russian borders, and they don't tend to attack Russian targets. So um, it, it seems fairly obvious that, you know, they're almost a, a branch of the uh, state apparatus. But uh, yeah, I'm always looking at Kaspersky a little sidelong going, hmm, I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I think it's a reasonable question to ask, but I, I haven't uh, heard, you know, I, I follow a ton of security researchers and I haven't really heard that whispered about by people who know better. And then the, uh, you had a big, one of your slides had a big list of resources to, to draw upon. Um, can we get a list? Can we get that somewhere else in text? Yeah, that list is the very first link in the chat. Uh, or not the very first link in the chat. I think that was a dog. Um, but there was one that uh, was it the announcement in the found the found like Claire's community announcement one that was oh. at 27 should link to that. Okay. But if not, I can paste it in right now. Just okay, better safe than sorry, right? Let's see. There we go. And here is that list. Oh yeah, I put a few of those ones from the email that you sent me. It looked like the list you had in that slide though was even longer. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, that's ten. There should be ten links there. Oh, these are the ones right here you put in this chat. Yeah, in the chat here, yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks. Yeah, I think you got most of it now. All right, so yeah, save the chat. We will. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Last chance for your next attack. Well, I'm not gonna be able to get to sleep tonight. <laughs> But definitely just check out that R77 rootkit. That is the cat's pajamas. Yeah. That's pretty cool stuff. Very cool. Yeah. All right then. Yeah, this is it's a whole nother level. <laughs> you want you want to be able to hand this to somebody else and say, "Hey, could you uh, look at this for us?" <laughs> <laughs> and to some extent, that, that's exactly what needs to happen, right? So like I said in the beginning, uh, it's not on us as pharmacy developers to, to become experts at all of this, but by being aware, we can help drive the conversation, right? To make sure that, 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 that clients pay attention to it, that we can insert ourselves in conversations or, or drive or help drive the conversations around it. Um, by no means do we need to solve this uh, on our own. No, oh, thank goodness. You know, actually, one of the links you sent me here, which one is it? Actually, I found pretty interesting. Kind of, like it was 
off topic. Was that one by David Heyman from is it Germany? Let me put it in the chat. Oh, yeah. David Heyman, yeah. Not, not ransomware, but the... Uh... Right, no, yeah. He discovered a vulnerability in the uh, XML uh, processing. Now, do we, do we, I don't suppose anybody volunteers to have him, you know, acknowledging that they were hit by such an attack, but was anybody actually ever hit by that or is it just something discovered? I, I, I have that... not heard of anyone being hit by that, but, uh, you know, it was just some uh, original research that he did that determined that it, it's not really well protected. No. Uh, to, to me, this is, um, People don't use that feature of the product enough for that to be like a significant attack service. You know, there, there's like a moment in time where it could be a, an attack surface. So I think it's uh, certainly worth addressing, but I, I see it as a small threat. Hmm. Oh, for those who don't know what we're talking about, it's, there was a vulnerability in, in, was it just WebDirect or also... Um... I think the example you was in was in WebDirect, right? Where if you you could actually upload an XML file that had instructions to go in there and and uh, help compromise your server, right? Um, it, it was something about XML having the ability, and is I don't know if Beverly's still there. Uh, XML having the ability to kind of do something analogous to a cross site. That um, I'm not an expert on XML, but it was like. <laughs> Yeah, Bev, did I get that right, or what? what what's the? You no, the the XML contains the instructions, but the processing with the XFLT or other processors will read that and then follow through with what they need to do to execute. Hmm. Oh, so, what's the is the attack surface? Check your XML first. Look at that thread on on the community. I added some information that that might help. Um, go to those sources that they have in that link, and it will tell you what to look for. And then there are fixes now um, with the latest versions of FileMaker to prevent that if you are using that processing. But this can happen outside of FileMaker with any any processor, anything that's doing processing of the XML with that in it. You just have to be really, really aware of what you've got, what's your source, that hmm. kind of thing. Oh, yep. So, Bev, Bev, I did I did read that link. Problem is, I didn't understand it as well as you. The <laughs> um, so X, XML, um, and as long as we're talking about it, might as well solve it. So I heard you say latest version has addressed the threat, and would would a snapshot link, which is XML under the hood, would that possibly would, would someone a, a bad person be able to build uh, something that looked like a snapshot link and and have malicious XML that would get processed by virtue of double clicking on the snapshot link? Is that I don't know. I, I, I don't think so because the, the vulnerability wasn't was in the library that was used to parse the XML and, and, and follow the instructions that were in it. Uh, I don't think that the snapshot link uh, uses that same library to, uh, to process the XML. Um, and, and I agree with, with Chris that the likelihood of this being used as, as a viable attack entry or, or vector is, is very, very small. What I particularly liked about the write-up that, uh, that David did about that is it really shows the kind of progression, like stacking an attack on top of an attack that, that is happening. And, and it's, it probably makes it very tangible for us as Famica developers to sort of follow what, what could happen. Um, because he, he's got some really good examples where you can then use that to, uh, to follow a, um, a file share. Uh, and then from that file share, you use another vulnerability to to try and get the uh, the credentials that give up, give you access to that file share, because that's exactly the kind of stuff that that I talked about in the harvesting that they do to then build that policy where they say we know that there's a file share there, we know that these are the credentials that we were able to to suss out of of what you have, 
um, on your network as with an unpatched library of, of some sorts and, and then build on that, right? So they, they find something, then they build on that, then find something else, they build on that. So it's, it's a very, uh, very sneaky path that they follow. David says they also note that the same XML parser is used for processing snapshot links. There you go. Yeah. Which are the XML files as well. Uh, .fmpsl, which could come in handy when executing phishing attacks. Oh, I mean, if, and I did read the article and it, it caught my eye partly because I, I have a technique for, you know, replacing a snapshot link with an FMP URL protocol. Um, but I, I don't think if anyone's uh, listening to the recording, I think Famic is an awesome, very safe platform. Uh, but it certainly, yeah, no, it looked like really, really, I read it once and I read it fast. It did look like really impressive work that that guy did, David. It looked really interesting. Worth reading. Again. And I guess if anyone gives you a Snapchat link from now on, I'm not taking snap li Snapchat links from just anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, that's the my point was you need to know what your source is for your XML to begin with. Don't process it if you don't know, uh, if you don't trust it. And you can look at the XML without processing and verify whether it's even valid. Right, absolutely. Just drag it on a, a BB edit and whatnot. Yeah, trusted sources for sure. I, I thought it was really, really interesting because Snapchat links are very cool and, and they're just text. Yeah. That's true. It's like most Snapchat links are really, I mean, either you're going to produce them for yourself or one of your peers, at least, at least the way we use it, it's, you know, your, your peers will produce one, you know, for each other. Um, but, yeah, you know, and, and you'll produce some for yourself. But I don't know of any place just things coming out of the blue for you or you would get them from some unknown source. I opened a Excel file today and I, I clicked the disable macros button. Hmm. So the whole thing's a macro, right? No, I think it was safe. It was actually it was from a trusted source that had macros, but even though it was trusted source, I don't, I don't need nobody running macros. <laughs> right. And even Apple Script and FileMaker files, you know, you get a FileMaker file, you should, you know, if it's downloading, you should run it with the debugger in case somebody's trying to prank you there. Hmm. Yeah, thought about things like that. Just out of curious, has anybody ever made a semi viral FileMaker file? What's that? Has it made a semi-viral FileMaker file? Well, I, I've, I've never seen it actually happen, but, you know, with the features in the platform, you can, you could do something mean with a FileMaker file and an unopened script. So, you know, if you get a file from someone other than the people on this list, you should just open it the first time with the debugger would be best practice, I'd say. Just to see what it does when it opens, make sure it's not using some of them newfangled FileMaker 18 file features. Oh, there were simpler days. Hmm. Oh. All right, good fellas. I'll, um, ladies and gents, I'll have to sign off for tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank and you for you, the show. Coming from Wim. What's that? Where, where are you back east? Uh, Toronto. Toronto, yeah. Well, good night and thank you for staying up with us. No problem. I'll talk to you all later. All right. Bye. Bye. Hi. Well, I guess that's it for tonight, Steve. Thank you. <laughs>